Hi everyone. Uh, we understand. Uh, uh, we hope a few more. Uh, we understand few more people will join. But I, in the interest of time, I'll just start the session. So we are pleased to have you all for a session and engaging discussion on improving electrical economics the way forward today. I'm Ankit Gupta, AVP Energy and Climate Change Division at IntelliCap, and happy to here to share a few quick brief on the session for today. The session will be moderated by Mr. Rujesh Shukla, Director Electric Vehicle Program at Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, and he will be joined by esteemed guests, which he will introduce shortly with all of you. I'll quickly want to share the agenda for today. So we have initial 10 minutes where we have in the initial 10 minutes, we will have the welcome address and setting of the context by moderator Mr. Rujesh Shukla, Director Electric Vehicle Program at Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, followed by 15 minutes to one hour of panel discussion with our esteemed guests today. Uh, and uh, after this, we'll have a 10 to 15 minutes for an open Q&A &A and an open discussion with all of you. So we request all of you to put your questions, observations in the chat window, and we'll try to answer all the queries, suggestions towards the end of the program. Our team will be closely monitoring the chat window, and we will address all the questions towards the end. After that, in the next five to 10 minutes, we'll have a closing remarks and end of session by our moderator, Mr. Ruchil Shukla. So that's the plan for today. Uh, I quick, I request uh, Ruchir uh, to uh, give the welcome address uh, uh, and setting of context for the initial 10 minutes and then move as per the plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Ankit. And uh, uh, once again, uh, very good morning and warm welcome uh, to one and all uh, for this today's panel discussion on improving electric vehicle economics, the way forward. Uh, in my view, and I believe uh, all uh, here agree uh, that this is very uh, relevant from immediate to near term, uh, especially in Indian scenario. And uh, let me quickly uh, share, uh, you know, we will be following as uh, Ankit said, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, panelist here will follow the order uh, connecting with Abhay, uh, later Mara, and then uh, Srinivas in that order. And uh, what I'll be quickly sharing about uh, Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, uh, where I belong to, uh, give an introduction about its program uh, and the details we are working in this space. Uh, in a in, uh, quick uh, view, uh, Shakti uh, Sustainable Energy Foundation works to facilitate India's transition to a cleaner uh, energy future. Uh, we, we do that by designing and implementation of policies that promote clean power, energy efficiency, sustainable transport, climate policy, clean energy finance, and electric mobility initiatives. Now, specific to electric mobility initiative, this is a multi-funder program where uh, aligned uh, mindset uh, funders have participated together uh, and Shakti drives uh, ideation process, the type of uh, you know, projects which are uh, of relevance in near term, mid term and long term, uh, along with the type of segments which uh, are critical uh, with respect to the present scenario and future scenario uh, in the transportation sector, which is the mobility side, we uh, help consolidate and execute those uh, meaningful programs. Uh, Shakti is uh, Section 25, uh, not-for-profit organization headquartered in Delhi and supported by both national and international uh, philanthropies. Uh, the board is led by Sri Jamshed Godrej, uh, Chairman and Managing Director, Godrej Bias Manufacturing Company Limited. Uh, the EMI, as I said, uh, Electric Mobility Initiative is looking at uh, achieving the uh, uh, decarbonization of transport sector 100% by year 2020. That's a long uh, goal. Uh, and to achieve that, uh, that has been broken down to two-wheeler, three-wheeler, small vehicle, uh, commercial vehicle, both buses and heavy-duty trucks down the line, uh, cars, et cetera, et cetera. So in the whole process, uh, we are engaging with the charging infrastructure partners and uh, also the financing mechanism, which is what is uh, very critical today. Uh, about the topic which we have for the uh, discussion, on improving electric vehicle economics. The way forward is 
we see uh, in the uh, whole of this space, electric vehicle space, uh, especially again bringing back since this topic, uh, we are keeping more relevance from the Indian perspective. Uh, there has been a kind of a cost structure what people have been seeing in transport uh, uses, be it a personal commute, a personal uh, uh, use of vehicle, uh, or a fleet operator, or various other uh, you know, government agencies who run it. We have a, a, a very strong uh, Asian culture and back in India too, to look at it, what really it takes and what additional spending needed when we have to migrate to new technology or new product solutions. Uh, while everybody is sensitive and has seen great uh, you know, contribution in environment if we move or as we move towards electric mobility. So, so as, as core of it, the uh, overall vehicle economics, or I would say overall ecosystem economics plays a very larger role. Uh, in the recent past, we have seen a few of the uh, you know, segments, which is like smaller vehicle, two-wheeler, three-wheeler delivery vans, they have seen a TCO positive, uh, which is uh, you know, a, a very good sign. And also it's going to be really fueling uh, uh, you know, volume growth added with the uh, one side effect of uh, recent lockdown. We have seen a huge growth in delivery business, the last mile delivery of goods or other taking the groceries and other stuff to the uh, people's houses. And that is where uh, more and more of electric mobility, uh, uh, the vehicles which are two wheeler and three wheeler going to be playing a role, uh, uh, which is uh, easy for operate, uh, easy to charge, as long as they are smaller capacity vehicle, possibly they at times don't need uh, a large DC uh, charging station, but you know they are all managed well, either by AC charging bay or a battery swap model, depending on the choices a fleet operator today is doing it. So, so in nutshell, that's one side. Uh, while from the climate perspective and uh, greenhouse emissions perspective, we, we find that various studies have shown the trucks and all have been a great, uh, you know, contributor that way to the pollution. And therefore, as, as a community, we have to see how best, which are those, uh, you know, spaces of that uh, application where we can see uh, the trucks or, you know, uh, the vehicle economics can work. Could be, chances are like a short distance uh, travel routes, which are like sub 100 kilometer which are uh, some couple of places where you have uh, material, uh, you know, have to be shifted from maybe a mine to a nearby uh, railway yard or something like that. You know, those are the places and, uh, you know, uh, tracks which we need to really identify and look at it while there is a uh, scale of economy available because of repeat trips within those selected two ends. And possibly we also see uh, the distance being smaller doesn't really call for huge battery, which is still a cost element. And therefore there is a balancing of, uh, you know, uh, approaching towards uh, heavy duty commercial vehicle, apart, apart from the buses, also in trucks, as I say, to look at the, you know, uh, improving vehicle overall economics, you know, and, and then way forward, we see that in next couple of years, we'll possibly see that as a low hanging area to really approach and have a lot of companies to come forward and work on uh, that space. So with this, let me quickly uh, uh, go ahead and um, uh, introduce uh, our eminent panel members. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Abhay Srivastava. Uh, Abhay works as business development advisor for India, Shell Foundation, a UK registered independent charity that creates and scales business solution to enhance access to energy and affordable transport for low-income population. Abhay provides strategic advisory to portfolio startup focused on mobility solutions in India. He also carries a good understanding of electric vehicle ecosystem to support development of mobility uh, thesis for social uh, investments at Self Foundation. And Abhay brings a lot of financial and uh, other uh, you know, valuable insights 
and will be sharing as part of his uh, you know, uh, portion. Uh, next to that, we have uh, Mara from uh, Siemens Foundation. She is based in Munich, Germany, uh, has nine years of professional experience, uh, rich experience in East African markets, uh, have been uh, you know, on consultation for German and international companies, Germany in Germany and other international companies. As a member of Siemens Foundation team, she is shaping the foundation's program on electric mobility for impact, focusing on electric mobility for productive use in rural and peri-urban markets in sub-Saharan African area. It's also supporting local value chains for electric mobility technology financing solutions for social enterprises and startups. And Mara uh, is a, a great uh, member to this panel discussion today, We're going to be bringing some of the use cases, experiences, and the outcomes uh, which she has, uh, you know, maybe at an early stage, but whatever she has observed while running these shows out there. And, and similarity between that international perspective to the Indian ecosystem. Uh, last but not the least, we have uh, Srinivas, uh, a great uh, entrepreneur, uh, co-founder and COO of Moselle, an EV platform that has pioneered commercial develop deployment of electric buses in India. Prior to this, he funded GlowShip to accelerate the adoption of solar energy, uh, first of its kind B2C platform for demand aggregation and a patented technology platform to equip installers to address last mile challenges. So here is what we have uh, all, all the, uh, you know, great uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, people who have been working in across the belt. Uh, now, now let me quickly, without wasting any time, request Abhay. Uh, and um, after Abhay, I'll request Mara to introduce and then Srinivas for each of them 10 minutes talk about their uh, own self uh, company and spending more time talking about their idea in this whole um, project or the target um, EV ecosystem, what we are talking about. Over to you, Abhay. Thanks, Richard. Happy to be part of this panel. And that's some very interesting comments you have made uh, about briefing people about the development which has happened so far in electric vehicles. And you use the word ecosystem economics rather than vehicle economics, uh, which is quite interesting and uh, which I believe uh, we would be debating today. So uh, uh, just uh, would like to share uh, two lines on Shell Foundation. Uh, it's a UK registered independent charity uh, which support early stage enterprises with grant and strategy support to de-risk their end market entry and in order to help them uh, attract commercial funding for a uh, uh, scaled up impact. Uh, that's what we do at Foundation. Now, coming back to the topic uh, about electric vehicle ecosystem economics. Uh, so let's understand the Indian market first. So it's, it's a bit unique wherein uh, the majority of electric vehicles which are sold are electric three-wheelers, the electric e-rickshaws, followed by low-speed uh, two-wheelers. And then you have other variants uh, in two-wheelers, which are like high-speed and then four-wheelers, uh, cars and electric buses. Uh, you also made an interesting point about the TCO. So if you look at the market, TCO for three-wheelers and low-speed two-wheelers uh, is uh, quite beneficial towards uh, the buyer side. Uh, there is no, uh, I mean, debate whether what a customer should be opting if they look at TCO for uh, electric rickshaws or low speed two wheelers. Uh, and this is evident from the sales which has happened so far for these particular electric vehicles. But that's not the case with other electric uh, electric two wheelers or four wheelers or even uh, buses for that matter. They are, I guess, uh, hundreds or thousands of number in uh, versus what we have clogged uh, for other electric vehicle segment. So what I mean to say that if we were to improve the economics, then we have to look at some of the good practice uh, within uh, electric vehicle ecosystem. Uh, a three wheeler, for example, and borrow some of the good practices from the ICE ecosystem, which uh, I believe is uh, 
more mature compared to electric vehicle ecosystem. So for electric vehicles, uh, if the ecosystem has to perform, then individual elements of these electric value chain, ranging from OEMs, your battery as a service providers, charge stations, dealers, financiers, and buyers, they have to work in sync. Uh, and what I would like to focus uh, uh, is on the relationships revolving around dealers. Because if you look at uh, uh, the dealers of electric vehicles, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we cannot treat them like dealers of mature IC ecosystem where sales usually happens once the vehicle is made available in stores. Uh, the dealers of electric vehicles have to do a variety of tasks, uh, starting from sales origination, educating their pot potential customers, uh, working on fulfillment and paperwork coordination, and coordination with financiers, uh, you know, and including collection of uh, EMIs or monthly installments at uh, some of the instances, and after sales surveys. So uh, you you may think that uh, dealers tend to become uh, I'll use the word bottleneck here at times for electric vehicle penetration. And uh, my my first question is: Are they adequately prepared to manage the task which a uh, current ecosystem has trusted them with? And uh, are they trained enough to deliver what is being required for, from them? So you, you would find that uh, from our experience of working, uh, working deeply in three-wheeler space, we find that uh, dealers at times are not uh, you know, adequately informed or adequately prepared on what is to be done in order to make a sales conversion. So there is information available on uh, TCO, what a potential customer can earn. And then there are concerns around charging stations, uh, battery performance, but all these can be addressed if our dealers who are the front face, who are the, you know, uh, who are responsible for placing these electric vehicles on the roads into the hands of customers, uh, they aren't uh, you know, prepare to uh, deliver a customized pitch for uh, some of the uh, buyers. I mean, most of the thesis-based TCO or uh, pitch may not be uh, impactful in converting an inquiry into sales. What is required from them is to understand the need of customer, the need of buyer, whether it is three-wheeler, two-wheeler, or four-wheeler, uh, they need to be adequately informed to understand the need of buyer and then uh, uh, look at uh, whether uh, the, the product he or she is buying uh, actually suits their need or not. Uh, that's something I would like to highlight from the way forward point because uh, uh, you're right that we have in India seen a lot of policy improvement, many uh, new innovative solutions coming into market, including battery as a service, some of the NBFCs doing uh, financing of these electric vehicles. But uh, if you ask me what could be the way forward for further developing the ecosystem for electric vehicles. It has to be the stakeholders ranging from OEMs working very closely with uh, uh, electric vehicle dealers. And uh, some of the good practice, which uh, I suppose uh, we can borrow from IC market is uh, like uh, uh, discounts on uh, disposing their uh, old vehicles and purchasing a new vehicle, more like an exchange offer, which we have seen uh, quite a number of times in Indian market. And then uh, uh, try before you buy. Uh, these are the two good practices, which uh, we have seen working generally well for IC market, but have not been uh, that popular in EV market. I'm sorry if they, uh, I mean, if there are has been uh, recent such schemes, uh, which I'm not informed of. Uh, but I believe that uh, scale or uh, electric vehicle penetration can be driven uh, only if dealers are adequately equipped to deliver sales. Uh, in, and the second most important uh, stakeholder, which I would like to mention is uh, uh, the NB, the role of consumer financing, the role of NBFCs, because uh, from our experience of working very closely with three wheelers, we have seen that there are handful of NBFCs, uh, non banking financial companies, uh, who do consumer financing. There, there, there are certain, uh, I would say, barriers to them uh, or 
most of the NBFCs entering into this space. This is like availability of uh, secondary market, uh, a uncertainty around uh, depreciation of uh, the electric vehicles, and the credit worthiness of low income buyers who are uh, usually buying the electric rickshaws and low speed two wheeler, which uh, has, you know, a kind of uh, uh, you know, covered the entire EV market in India. So how do we de-risk uh, these NBFCs to enter uh, consumer financing, uh, similar to what uh, already exists for IC vehicles? I mean, you go to any dealer, uh, you already have financing options available with them. But that's not the case with uh, many electric vehicle dealers. So, and I believe uh, the, the way uh, buying of vehicles happen in India, financing plays a very crucial role uh, to convert the inquiry into a sales decision. Uh, at Shell Foundation, uh, we have been working very closely with our partners in order to provide uh, instruments like FLDG to uh, NBFCs, uh, First Laws Default Guarantee, uh, to the NBFCs who uh, has been uh, showing inclination to uh, provide consumer financing to this low income population. Uh, so, uh, and I, I, I think, I uh, yeah, sorry, Abhay. So I guess a very valuable point to start uh, the thoughts flowing and I know there's going to be a really big one. So you're going to be having uh, the next portion if you're okay. Uh, in, sure, in, the, sure, in sure. the next, uh, you know, the uh, next uh, set of questions when we have, uh, these are very, very valuable, as you mentioned, I think, uh, I will request to just give a pause and then sure. uh, we'll come back on, on this again. So uh, now Thanks, next Richard. on, thank you. Next to Mara, uh, would you like to really give some opening thoughts and uh, introduction about your work? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ruchir, um, and thanks, Apai, for the um, introduction to foundations. So like Apai, I work for a foundation, so Siemens Foundation. It's a German registered nonprofit, and we support social enterprises and social startups in innovative technology, uh, mostly for productive use, um, as we think that um, entrepreneurial approaches help in uh, development. So in the e-mobility program, we focus on rural and peri-urban um, sector in Africa because um, more than 60% of Africans live outside urban areas. So it's like still it's the majority and it's a huge uh, market. What we see there in the base of the pyramid is that some of the households have to spend up to 70% of their income for transport to access markets, to access schools, to access healthcare. So for us, mobility is not like, let's say, a topic for itself. It's like really um, a catalyst data um, to ensure good agriculture products, to reduce post-harvest losses, and like to foster the development for whole regions. And in that regard, we focus on local value chains, or let's say as local as possible value chains. So um, education and uh, training, um, upskilling of local technicians, um, buying um, electric vehicles and operative testing on site in Kenya, so that's our testing site, are an important element of our program. Then um, we offer pre-seed or innovation funds to social startups as we want to increase the database um, of e-mobility data for Africa. Um, I'm really excited to be here today because I think um, our work can still learn a lot from uh, the Indian market because let's say you're a lot further. So um, today I'm especially excited to have this exchange so that we can see uh, what are maybe, the, yeah, what is parallel? So where can we learn, but as well, what is um, different? When we look at the, the African market, um, it's like, it's a huge market. So there are 650 million of people who are walking using public transport or using light transport. So while Africa has one of the lowest motorization rates uh, worldwide, it's uh, really growing. So like a lot of people are buying vehicles, it's dominated by secondhand market, but as well, new vehicles are really taking up. However, in our work, we mostly focus on two and three wheel transport, as Apai said as well for India, because that's the largest growth segment. Um, I know when I tell numbers about East Africa compared to Indian market, it always sounds not so much. But uh, for example, in Kenya, 
Last year, 180,000 motorbikes have been imported. And Indian brands, like that's combustion engine bikes, Indian brands are very popular, mostly by charge and uh, TBS. So when we look at the markets, where we say immobility for productive use, we try to see what um, mobility is used at the moment and how the economics work. So um, from the motorbike riders, 60% of them don't own their bikes. So they're already leasing for either from banks like through Paygo or leasing from other um, owners, which offers a good chance for immobility um, as we can like tap that market when uh, people don't own the bikes. So they're like quite interested and excited to try the um, electric uh, motorbikes. Like generally, what we focus on is as well to reduce fuel dependency. So um, our pilots in, in Western Kenya are all off-grid solar charged. Um, and the, um, the, what we try as well is to use different business models. So at the moment, we're the foundation for our operative testing. We have um, five startup partners. So um, we introduced um, electric cargo bicycles. So it's kind of like a pedelec, a bicycle um, that has electric um, enhancement, which is especially good for water transport. So to bring water from, the, uh, from like our safe um, drinking water wells to the households, um, as well for farm and fish transport. Uh, we saw as well that um, restaurants um, and like construction sites started using um, the bikes. So that's like one of the products. Then we have a partner that is piloting electric boat engines uh, on Lake Victoria for uh, night fishing. We have um, electric uh, motorbikes from our partners um, in testing. And that is both um, electric bikes produced in Kenya and as well conversion kits for traditional motorbikes that went out of service, maybe because the um, the engine um, had a problem, so that can be swapped then to um, electric bikes. What we test as well is um, uh, like business models for productive use. So it's mostly um, sharing economy, um, pay per use, as well longer term leasing. Uh, we pilot battery swap and battery flat rate and venturing as well in um, different uses for batteries, for example, for e-agriculture tools like walk-in tractor or solar irrigation pump. So um, I like the, the point you made about e-mobility ecosystem. And like in the use case for Western Kenya, I would even make that bigger. It's not only mobility, but like battery standard or battery as a service can be used for like for a whole lot of products that can help uh, develop the development um, of the region. So yes, I'm quite excited to, to see what we can learn from each other. And um, yes, bring a bit the African um, uh, perspective, especially from Western Africa, um, from Eastern Africa and Kenya into the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mara. Uh, very, very uh, well said and uh, sharing your uh, couple of uh, great initiatives uh, which you are taking there. Now I'll quickly go to Srinivas for him to introduce and share his thoughts, opening remarks. Thank you, uh, over to Srinivas. Uh, thanks, Ruchir. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Abhay and Mara for those remarks. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I, uh, I am a co-founder of a company called Muzev, and we are essentially an EV platform uh, that has uh, started our journey by pioneering the commercial deployment of electric uh, buses in India. So unlike, I think, uh, what my fellow panelists have spoken about, which is, uh, you know, which is more uh, consumer focused, uh, you know, we are, uh, we are focusing here at Mozev uh, on the electrification of uh, commercial vehicles. And we've started with uh, kind of the medium or uh, heavy commercial vehicle segment. So we find, uh, you know, uh, when we looked at uh, the different uh, segments for electrification, um, we found that uh, buses as a segment, uh, you know, uh, was just, uh, you know, there, there were a couple of factors uh, that we found uh, very attractive uh, when it comes to buses. One is just uh, uh, from an impact perspective, uh, almost 70% uh, of, uh, you know, of the surface transport kilometers uh, that people undertake in a country like India uh, is on buses, right? 
So from the perspective of being able to create impact, uh, whether it is uh, you know, uh, environmental reasons or whether it is uh, to address the fiscal deficit that the country has, uh, you know, buses just, uh, we, we believe, uh, have a huge role to play. And then, uh, you know, there are other characteristics that the segment has, which is uh, about, you know, point-to-point -point operation, uh, you know, very high uh, utilization. Uh, so, you know, about 400 to 600 kilometers a day. And, uh, and, and you, know, uh, you know, predictable uh, usage patterns. So uh, we found that some of these characteristics uh, lend uh, buses as a segment, as a segment, um, you know, uh, you know, in in, in, a, in a very favorable uh, uh, manner towards uh, electrification. So uh, in line with I think uh, some of the comments we've heard, wherein uh, you know uh, there is a there is a need to be able to uh, bring the ecosystem uh, together, and actually drive profitability at an ecosystem level. Uh, we at Mosef have actually uh, taken a similar approach, uh, wherein uh, we provide our customers uh, uh, essentially a single interface uh, to be able to make the transition uh, to EVs, right? Um, and and uh, by, by providing this single interface and kind of taking an end-to-end -end view of the transition, uh, what we're able to do is we're able to kind of drive profitability uh, not only for the end customer who's adopting the uh, vehicle, uh, but also for the different participants uh, in the ecosystem, be the, you know, whether they are OEMs, whether they are uh, charging, uh, charging infra providers, uh, whether they are o and companies, uh, being able to drive uh, profitability for all of them. So our, uh, our full stack offering at Mozev uh, essentially uh, is, uh, is, is with an intent to support the customers on all, on all you know, throughout their uh, life cycle. So from supporting them initially on the vehicle sourcing and configuration uh, to, uh, to providing uh, different financing options on the platform, uh, to providing access to charging infrastructure uh, in a pay-as-you-go model, uh, to, uh, to essentially helping them operate and maintain uh, these fleet of vehicles uh, through data-led insights, and uh, you know, uh, and, and eventually also kind of guaranteeing dual uh, value monetization uh, of both the bus and battery. Uh, what we're essentially trying to uh, uh, do uh, is is kind of support them uh, on an end-to-end -end basis, right? So, um, so in terms of what our learnings have been, uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know what could be helpful uh, in terms of accelerating adoption, uh, specifically within this segment. Uh, I think needless to say, as my fellow panelists have already mentioned, uh, I think financing just plays a huge role, right? And uh, when we look at uh, financing, uh, we believe that, um, you know, uh, I mean, the entire uh, financing paradigm uh, kind of needs to be, uh, you know, uh, reimagined. So compared to the uh, you know, standardized model of vehicle financing uh, that is largely driven commercial vehicle financing, not only in India, but, but even in other parts of the world, uh, you know, with the advent of uh, you know, uh, electric vehicles, I think what we need is possibly customized offerings uh, wherein the financing solution uh, can be tailored uh, to the needs of specific customer segments uh, and and also the different cash cash flow profiles uh, that you know th that are there depending on either the vehicle type or the application that the vehicle is being purposed for. So there is uh, there is a very very uh, urgent need, uh, kind of in terms of being able to rethink financing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you know uh, across segments, I think uh, it is a uh, you know there is a digital first approach being taken by most platforms, a digital first and data-driven approach. And so I think uh, a lot of this uh, needs to tie in uh, to, uh, to the, uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, risk management concerns that financiers have. And, 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 and doing so is what basically enables you uh, to reimagine financing and, and making it a lot more relevant 
uh, uh, to the needs of uh, you know uh, the uh, the electric vehicle segment. So with those remarks, I'll I'll kind of uh, hand it over back to you, Ruth. Yep. Thank you, uh, Srinivas. And uh, once again, I, I thank each one of you for really great thought processes uh, around the uh, overall, uh, you know, uh, you know, subject what we have on economics. Now, uh, while we get uh, onto the specific questions, uh, again, each one of you, starting with Abhay, uh, the request I'll make uh, again, bringing back uh, and you know, uh, attention on that. What is it we are looking at out of takeaway or any of our, uh, you know, participants, members in this forum? We're, look, we're again trying to look at uh, deep dive on a couple of aspects. Let me reiterate just to bring the focus more critical back there. Uh, the first thing what we are looking at, what are the most critical elements consider, con or considerations for improving the economics of EVs? Again, in India, uh, in case of Mara, you know, bringing back some of the similarities for India. So that's one thing, which is the uh, questions what we all have. Uh, what are the initiatives have you taken to promote EV adoption as per your own organization or the work area projects you guys are engaging with? The third question is the business models you have adopted or experimented to improve the overall EV economics. So bring back some thoughts around there. And fourth one was major barriers to scale. Uh, we know that each economy or, uh, you know, cost which are going to be spread over on the old ecosystem everybody looks at right volume critical volume to make that happen what is it that your organizations are doing and what are the barriers uh, you have uh, sensed so now coming back to abhay while keeping these uh, key points uh, top of our head the question here is uh, what are the finance you know what are the suggestions on financing of evs you know, which help understand the barriers and then de-risk uh, basically NBFC or banks doing consumer financing. Then viability of dealer network, as I think you're pretty passionate sharing that, and that's really very important between the manufacturer and end user and history you can't change digitally. We all in an era where dealer is most important critical element especially in transport sector or automobile sector. So what is it that you believe to promote and push the sales, including factors of TCO and et cetera? So now, now over to you, Abhay, again, and you have close to seven minutes or so uh, to summarize it. Thanks, thanks, Ruchir. So uh, seven minutes, uh, I think I have to be <laughs> quick and precise here. So uh, coming to the very specific uh, points, like what, uh, at Shell Foundation we are doing. Uh, we work with early stage enterprises um, and uh, by supporting a similar uh, early stage enterprise based out of Varanasi who is uh, uh, trying to provide market linkage for low income population towards asset ownership of uh, electric rickshaws for their livelihood generation, including women. Uh, we learned that, uh, I mean, it's, uh, from from outside world, it may look that if the electric rickshaw is available at a 50% of cost, it will sell like a hot cake. But it, it doesn't happen uh, due to two reasons. One, obviously, uh, awareness of uh, the customers uh, make them uh, realize that uh, what they can earn out of electric rickshaw, although there, there is enough information available on charging infrastructure, concerns around batteries, lead acid batteries versus lithium ion batteries. So plenty of information is available. But what we uh, learned that the key bottleneck was availability of consumer finance to these low income borrowers. This is what we, uh, uh, tried solving uh, with uh, some of our interventions. So first was providing first loss default guarantee to some of these NBFCs uh, in order to share some of the risk uh, which uh, consumer financing of low income borrowers, which are usually considered uh, less credit worthy by these NBFCs. So that's an, an, a specific intervention we made and uh, we were pretty uh, successful in some of the markets uh, our portfolio company was operating. But when we started, uh, when this company started scaling up, we realized that we need more partners. And uh, we, uh, I mean, it's you can provide FLDG to an extent, uh, guarantees to an extent, but how do you make an 
you know business case for other nbfcs to come in automatically without the need of uh, guarantees from corporate players so uh, and uh, uh, bear in mind that uh, covid hit us uh, at the start of this year so some of the equation did change so for example uh, obviously financing which was a bottleneck has uh, been constrained but what we also observed that uh, the demand has also uh, crashed for electric rickshaws and uh, to an extent for i believe low speed uh, two wheelers as well so uh, an intervention is required to bring back the demand and uh, you mentioned about the specific point how we can uh, work forward to bring in electric vehicle economic so uh, let let me uh share that uh, we are trying to create a uh, project involving an nbfc uh, a dealer and a tech based market linkage player now why the need so uh, very quickly so how does sales of electric rickshaws happen uh, in market so if you were to buy an electric rickshaw you will approach your family and friends and inquire about the uh, uh, income level you can generate out of electric rickshaw now this income level due to covid has uh, reduced to one third one fourth in many instances which is why demand itself has uh, crashed now how can you bring the demand back if i bring in a tech based player who can provide access to commute or access to goods transport uh, with a slight assurance of income level uh, for the electric rickshaws then can nbfcs uh, uh, gain a confidence that uh, there is a surety of income level of their borrowers hence they can resume financing of electric vehicles or electric rickshaws in this case so this is an intervention uh we are working on currently what i mean to say as a take away that uh post covid if we were to look at electric vehicle adoption then these players cannot or will find it difficult working in silos there has to be a collaboration uh, right from oems charging station providers battery as a swap station providers dealers and financiers uh, in order to give confidence to each other and in order to share a uh, certain risk which electric vehicle market uh, currently is uh, uh, you know putting forward towards the ecosystem so those would be my two points uh, one financing with uh, fldgs and second collaboration among the stakeholders for electric vehicle penetration thanks very so much nice. uh, i hope yeah, i was very nice <laughs> thank you abhay and uh, really very very valuable uh, and touchy points which you have uh, covered in and uh, uh you know while we proceed uh, further with mara the question what uh, we have uh, for mara uh, the promising business models uh, you know that she has experienced experienced or you have seen there which are attracting investments in ev sectors in in, in africa and uh, uh, just for the benefit of all mara has been for long in india uh, but maybe uh, a decade back so how you really see that which are such models can be of uh, significance or kind of a learning for us here in india too over to you mara thanks a lot ruchir um yeah i think there are for sure um similarities between the the markets i think what's a big difference with the african markets is that they're really in ev in the infancy uh, stages so um in the end that's as well why we focus our work in um a lot of operative testing and supporting our partners financially and non financially in um developing the right product so uh, for example a lot of the uh, light evs two wheelers are more like for single use or as well for example rickshaws are not really uh, used in in africa so it's important to have the right product that finds acceptance in the um for the people so um in the end what we can see is that um like charging infrastructure has to be there but as well the right vehicle and in the in this early stage a lot of investors of course like clients they're very hesitant to um buy an electric vehicle because they don't know where to charge maybe no one has tried it so that's where we see as non profit foundation that we can bridge that gap and uh, purchase um or well, let's say support our uh, social enterprise or social startup partners in uh, purchasing early stage uh, technology 
to um, support HL testing. And how we do that is that normally you start with a small number of uh, vehicles. Um, let me give the example of cargo bicycles. So it's those bicycles that can uh, carry heavy loads. So um, for example, we purchased 20 and set up a testing plan with the um, enterprise um, and the social, like we have in Western Kenya, they're the charging hubs of uh, our social enterprise, which is called Betu. And uh, then through the testing, it is very clear um, that is the product good. So there are mechanical and electrical failures. The batteries are tested. There's acceptance testing with the users. How do they react? What's the price points um, that they can pay? So it's important to understand the market as it is. So how much are uh, people paying to, to lease a motorbike per day? How much do they pay for fuel? How much is the service? So that the price points can be right um, or like cheaper, hopefully, than uh, what the market uh, offers. And our experience shows that um, already in the, let's say the first month of testing, a lot of changes and suggestions come from, uh, from people in the field, from the users, how the bike or how the cargo bike, for example, should look like. So in the end, it's like a circle. So we have a small number of assets. We deploy them together with our partner in the market. There's testing protocol and the feedback is currently um, is implemented and implemented. So the goal for that is that um, after a certain period of time, we have a product that's kind of co-designed between the users locally and the manufacturer. Um, because before we go to Paygo, or we offer a product to the market, we don't want to put the risk on the consumer side. So it's like us as foundation, in that case, that's like de-risking the um, technical development of the, of the product. So that's like one of the things we are doing. And uh, generally, um, yeah, we, we do a lot of data generation as well on uh, carbon emissions. So it's something we didn't touch on so much. So what kind of charging infrastructure is needed in Kenya? Um, the grid is very green. So more than 90% of, um, in Uganda as well, uh, more than 90% of the energy in the grid is from renewable energy, but as well for areas that are underserved off-grid charging or island uh, networks are a big chance. So we do uh, research and pilots on, on that. Um, we look on the social and economic benefits to um, come up with the business models on charging and as well in, in leasing so that um, after those initial testing periods, other investors can go in the market, like social enterprises, for example, and help scale the, the sector. So that's one of the works we're doing. And in the chat, I actually saw that there were questions on, uh, on e-waste, on the battery. So I would quickly like to uh, touch on that. So it's very true that um, e-waste is dangerous and we have to take care that batteries don't end in the landfill. However, most of electric vehicles, they run with uh, Li-ion batteries and not with lead acid batteries. So the high danger of lead acid batteries, where like that's what normal cars um, or motorbikes uh, run with, is uh, lead poisoning, which is like uh, really dangerous and lethal. So for Li-ion batteries, the um, advantage is that they have a lot of uh, charging cycles. So um, normally several thousands. Uh, so one year has like 365 days. So you can imagine that a battery um, really can last for several years. And then um, it's important that we don't talk about recycling, but that we change our thought pattern a bit. So the first thing is always, how can I reuse the battery or how can I reuse the cells of the battery? And truth is that if a battery for electric vehicle goes out of service, often only some of the cells are damaged or the battery is still good enough to serve as a backup generator, like a backup um, for let's say a solar home system in the house. So instead of putting the battery to recycling straight away, it's more like, okay, so the, what's the state of the battery? Maybe we can reuse some of the cells and build a new battery. So we have a partner in Uganda uh, called Borderwork. They are piloting around battery development in um, Eastern Africa. And then the other, uh, the next step is, um, how can we use the batteries or the cell for another purpose that maybe is not so, uh, so hard, like that doesn't need so much power as like an electric vehicle. And normally um, solar home system use is, can be a good use case. And only in the end of that process, when the battery and the cells are really used, they can be put to recycling. So um, lithium can be recycled. So it's possible to uh, produce 
um, new batteries out of old lithium. At the moment, it's not very cost efficient. So that's again like a sector or like a area that could be regulated by governments to have like a quota that batteries need like a certain percentage of um, recycled uh, materials. Um, speaking again for Eastern Africa or for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's kind of sad news that there's no lithium recycling facility on the continent. So um, for the pilot we started, um, we work with a company called Enverosurf. So uh, we're collecting the batteries in the different um, chemistries. And in the end, they will have to be exported out of Kenya, for example, to Dubai, uh, to Belgium or to Southeast Asia. So that's like still there's a gap, but um, as battery is very high price asset, um, and especially for electric vehicles where the batteries are big and they can be traced, I believe it's possible to find like a circular economy, let's say a circular value chain in that. So that's as well a topic where we're really uh, focusing on. Thank you, Mara. Uh, very insightful uh, uh, points you touched upon, including second life of battery and recycling. And while we continue, uh, uh, here I go with Srinivas. And uh, with Srinivas, uh, uh, you have been in the a great entrepreneur all all you know in your previous and this present uh, uh, you know uh, business what you have created the question is uh, you know what are the major barriers you see uh, you know in terms of scaling up uh, uh, to the market you serve you know so how do you really see a scaling which is what is always a top of your head uh, being a startup there and uh, also is financial and non financial support uh, which uh, not only you, but any of the other entrepreneurs need to improve the overall economics. Again, focusing on uh, the sector which you are working in, in e-mobility, which is uh, buses, electric buses. So how do you uh, look at these two points and uh, please uh, share your thoughts and insights around this. Thank you. Over to you, Srinivas. Right, uh, <clears throat> right, uh, absolutely. So uh, just before I, I kind of address uh, the barriers to scale, just a little bit of market context, right? So uh, India, for example, has about uh, one and a half million buses flying on its roads, right? Of these, uh, only about 10 to, um, 10 to maybe 12% uh, are run by uh, the government or the uh, state transport undertakings as we call them in this country. But uh, the rest of uh, 85 to 88 uh, percent buses are all run by private operators, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so it's a hugely uh, fragmented market. Now, um, now also in terms of uh, if you look at where the economics of electrification are for this segment, um, you know the economics are extremely compelling. So, uh, at least as Mozev, our focus is uh, specifically the intercity travel, intercity or the tourist segment, uh, which is basically buses being used for travel between cities. And that again is uh, predominantly dominated by private operators. And what uh, and, and why this segment becomes uh, very attractive from an electrification perspective is because uh, the buses are able to do about 400 to 600 kilometers a day, right? And, and you know, because you're sweating the asset uh, at that level, uh, you know, it, it makes for very favorable uh, cost economics. And also, if you kind of look at the addressable market, uh, you know, 85% of the uh, market uh, is where the one-way routes are uh, less than 400, 500 kilometers. And the current technology uh, that we have uh, is, is perfectly capable uh, of, uh, of serving uh, this segment of the market. So, so essentially, uh, we have today technology that is viable and can address uh, 85 to 90 percent of the market, right? Uh, the economics are very compelling. Uh, on a cash-on-cash -cash basis, a private bus operator, uh, the surplus cash that they're left with uh, is 2x of what they would uh, be in a diesel scenario, right? So the economics are proven. And now, uh, if you kind of look at uh, you know uh, the uh, you know the the current uh, environment uh, with the pandemic and all of that. I think it's proven, uh, you know, uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, just the complete, uh, I, mean, I mean, complete lack of linkage between uh, crude oil price and uh, retail price of fuel in India, 
right? Uh, just because uh, of how important uh, fuel taxes are for government revenues, uh, there is a complete, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I mean, and that linkage doesn't exist in India, uh, unlike many other uh, countries in the world, right? So diesel prices have on, only gone up, uh, which has made the economics even more compelling. And plus, uh, uh, what electric actually enables for private operators uh, is because of the lower OPEX, uh, which is about 30% cheaper than uh, running a diesel bus. Uh, you can today recover your marginal cost uh, of running these buses at a much lower occupancy, uh, which is what the pandemic is also kind of forcing on you, right? So, uh, so kind of, uh, you know, uh, to, to summarize the market context, uh, we have a scenario where the economics are compelling and uh, also uh, the changes being brought about uh, by the pandemic currently uh, are also favorable. So uh, in this kind of an environment, um, uh, the, the, the big barrier to adoption uh, then becomes uh, financing from two perspectives, right? Uh, one is that, uh, you know, the ticket sizes we are talking about, at least in the bus segment, uh, are, very, are very, very large, right? So, uh, so even if you look at, you know, uh, uh, similar to what uh, Abhay spoke about, a first loss uh, a default guarantee program, or uh, even if you look at the interest of, uh, you know, leasing, uh, you know, automotive leasing is a very big business. Uh, but when it comes to commercial vehicles, uh, it uh, and, and uh, you know, buses, uh, I think the ticket size uh, for what is an emerging uh, segment, uh, that that basically becomes a huge issue, right? Um, so, uh, so uh, what, fr from the customer perspective, and what I mean is from the private operator perspective, uh, even though the economics are compelling, uh, there is a certain confidence they need uh, uh, around saying that, look, uh, you know, either, you know, if you have capital, you're going to, you're going to put that up front uh, to be able to finance the purchase of these buses, or alternatively, uh, you're going to look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, leasing options uh, that are going to minimize the uh, upfront uh, investment uh, that is required. So I think, um, you know, that is, that is one of the, um, uh, you know, one of the situ you know, one of the uh, major major barriers to adoption, I would say, uh, in this segment. Uh, and then, uh, looking at it from the perspective of financiers, uh, I think uh, again because the market is uh, market is very young, um, and uh, you know, the the financial models that uh, are used to assess uh, the residual value of batteries, residual values of the buses or uh, even in terms of uh, the view that financiers need to take on um, technology risk, right? So all of this is at a very uh, initial stage right now. And uh, there aren't that many empirical uh, models available out there uh, with a whole lot of uh, data uh, to be able to uh, provide confidence to financiers. So I think uh, that is kind of, um, you know, uh, looking at it from a financier perspective, uh, what they're looking at is, uh, you know, where is the uh, risk in this, and how do we uh, address that risk? And from a from a customer perspective, uh, where they are is that look, all of this uh, looks very attractive, but um, are there enough of these running out there uh, for me to, uh, you know, go ahead and put my own capital uh, to be able to finance the purchase uh, of these buses? Yeah, with those comments, uh, over, you, over to you, Richard. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Srinivas. Uh, very insightful and uh, uh, very well articulated uh, the overall uh, size of segment and the various interlinkages with the financing. And uh, the interesting point you have highlighted here is more cash in hand 2x times, which is anybody in the business would like to have. But I think if I got you right, by having electric mobility in place of diesel, uh, your, your takeaway here is they have much better cash because running cost is literally, you know, insignificant than what you see in the fleets when people are running the diesel vehicle. Very good. Thank you very much for your uh, insightful uh, comments and, uh, you know, sharing the views. Now, uh, while we progress further, uh, the next uh, quick, uh, 
most important uh, takeaway uh, each one of you would like to really highlight. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll go in the same sequence, uh, maybe a minute or two. Uh, two minutes, I think, will be good. Abhay, uh, then Mara, and Srinivas. So out of whole of your discussion, what is it uh, you want uh, to have as a takeaway from uh, your perspective, uh, keeping this our uh, point of topic as, as the central focus point? Over to you, Abhay. Thanks, Richard. Uh, some very good points uh, by Srinivas and Mara. And to be honest, I uh, learned a lot in this uh, session. Uh, I mean, if I were to uh, take one learning out of what was said, uh, is how the ecosystem works. So Mara mentioned some interesting points, how they have co-designed the mobility solution, suiting to the need of the buyer or the commuter. So I think... Uh, same can be uh, said for electric vehicle adoption in India. How do we make all uh, individuals in the electric vehicle value chain work together for a seamless offering to the customer? So I know there are barriers to entry. I We all know that, uh, I mean... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, on financing side, uh, the market is fragmented from uh, OEM side, the market is fragmented. But uh, if we were to collaborate and uh, address those well barriers, then I think uh, the way forward would be a bit smoother. Uh, on top of it, uh, there are policies uh, which I think government uh, of India is progressing well, uh, including the individual state policies. So all that can work in sync uh, if we collaborate more closely, uh, thinking from the need of customer, thinking from the need of commuter for which the electric vehicle is meant. Thanks, Ruchir. Thank, thank you, Abhay. Uh, concluding remarks uh, from you, Mara. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. For me, the panel was really interesting as well. So um, I think it's always easy to point to financing, what's the biggest hurdle of the market, but it was somehow as well encouraging to hear that like the thoughts and the um, problems are a bit similar, which should give the potential to learn together. And I think for me, the key takeaway is to um, work together. It's kind of like a chicken and the egg problem. If there are no charging stations or there's no financing, nobody can afford the EVs. So it's kind of really a sector approach that is needed to um, reach that tipping point that um, access to e-mobility or as well like uh, purchasing of uh, electric vehicles is like a no-brainer for people because the economics makes sense. It's more like these hurdles why they uh, they make sense in general, but they might might not make sense for the single user yet because he cannot um, achieve. So I'm really looking forward and on working that topic together and as well learning from India in that case. Thank you, Mara. Uh, very well said. And uh, now over to you, Srinivas, your concluding remarks and uh, takeaways. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I was actually looking at the chat window, and I think um, uh, there is a question here uh, uh, that says that, uh, you know, looking at the digital angle, what can e-mobility platforms offer for consumers in the future, right? So, uh, so I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of use uh, the opportunity to address this. Uh, because as a as a digital platform, uh, you know uh, what you're what you're bringing to the customer uh, is a single view of the different elements uh, here, right? So let me give you an example. So uh, you know Mara just spoke about uh, the need for uh, you know charging infra to be in place. Now uh, you know uh, going back to the example of the bus segment that we operate in. Now for uh, you know. Uh, 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 you know, as it is, you find that the capex of the electric bus is higher uh, compared to that of the diesel bus. Now, you've just got to make sure that as far as the other infrastructural elements are concerned, uh, the burden of that capex is not posed on the customer. And the way you can address that is, is basically by a sharing of infrastructure. So, uh, it, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, in, the, in the approach that we as Mosev have taken is... Uh, we look at a particular route. Uh, we uh, need to mobilize capital to be able to invest in the charging infrastructure, but making sure that that infrastructure is shared across customers is what eventually uh, brings down uh, the cost of uh, electricity uh, for uh, for an end customer on that network, right? And as a digital platform, um, 
you know, uh, like I mentioned, uh, our full stack offering, right from vehicle sourcing and configuration, uh, all the way down to, uh, you know, residual value management that's required a few years down the line. Uh, you know, as long as you have a data layer uh, that, that captures, uh, you know, the performance of the asset uh, in these different stages uh, and, and uh, you know, provides a view to the customer for them to be able to manage their operations, but equally provides a useful view to financiers who are trying to assess the risk of their investments or uh, even in terms of you know, uh, you know, other participants in the ecosystem who maybe want to repurpose these batteries for other applications at the end of their lives. I think uh, you know, as a digital platform, uh, what you can do is uh, you know, this data layer uh, that you have running end to end uh, can, can then uh, you know, provide uh, that visibility uh, to all the participants. And hence, uh, having, uh, having this kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, layer uh, across the value chain uh, I think is uh, absolutely critical uh, to be able to drive things forward. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Srinivas, for your concluding remarks and also answering one of the good questions there. Uh, I think with this, uh, we had a very engaging and insightful session uh, so far, and uh, we will uh, walk through a couple of questions, which we are uh, seeing there are many such questions and uh, I, I see in chat box and uh, what we'll attempt to uh, go through a couple of them uh, from audience. Uh, so here I go. The first question is uh, any insight on the future of hydrogen cell-based EV vehicles or alternate promising battery technologies in the future? But the interest of our topic I'll try to add on supplement this question, look at it from EV adoption and uh, improving the economy. We are already, you know, it's like always there is a futuristic technology which is, uh, get, you know, getting matured, et cetera. So what is it? We have to first get the economy right of that new evolving uh, ecosystem. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, look at this as a general question. So I look at it, uh, you know, uh, looking at first uh, from Abay, uh, a quick, short answer, uh, and then uh, any one of you who would like to add on. Over to sure, you, Abay. Sure, Richard. So uh, FCEVs, uh, fuel cells, as we call them, I, as of now, I feel they are, uh, there is a high cost involved in their production, in fuel cell stacks, and then setting up distribution centers for this fuel, uh, hydrogen fuel station. So that the cost associated with with these FCVs is one of the barriers I see uh, for uh, our country. And second, the safety around uh, hydrogen, because as we all know, hydrogen is flammable and uh, any exposure can even cause uh, thermal injuries to the users, to the commuters. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel unless these are addressed for the price sensitive market we are in, I uh, fail to understand uh, how this will uh, you know, further accelerate in the Indian market. Yeah, very well said, Abhay. Uh, and uh, you're true. I mean, uh, uh, there has been uh, in even electrochemistries of batteries, uh, uh, way beyond work is going on. But yes, as we see anytime, there are few who have reached to certain level of commercialization, have been tested against various requirements of the application and automotive being one of the safety critical and liability driven uh, space application. It's very important to have both commercial viability and rest all attributes get established before uh, you know, uh, there's a room created for the new technology to start penetrating while there are early signals and early experiments basis right. individual geography or country's choices of starting with, for example, Japan has taken a call starting from mostly the fuel cell FCV. So anything uh, further to add from Srinivas or Mara on this topic before we switch to the second question? A quick yeah, one? Maybe, yeah, maybe one point. I think it's very important as well to um, take into account the mobility patterns um, when you think about better technology. 
So like, let's say the most expensive or the biggest battery is not always the best one because you need to see as well, like the, the weight of it, is it taking away cargo space um, from like the cargo bike or the motorbike? So um, what are the, the patterns? Like are people like uh, for the buses, for example, it's very different because like going big distances for rural um, mobility, we see it's more like around a hub. So people are going like from the market to the farm, bringing customers from the bus stop to the houses. It's not such a big radius. So I think it's not only the battery technology, but as well, how are people using batteries and where do they want to recharge and swap, uh, which is really important, like um, beyond this handling and the safety, of course. Thank you, Mara. Uh, any, any inputs uh, from you, Srinivas? Otherwise, we have the second question for Mara, just to continue. Uh, how does the PEGO model influence the economics of EV? Mm, for me, it's like one of the biggest chances to make EV accessible. And um, like the good thing is about PEGO, that especially with the solar home uh, systems, the uh, let's say the concept and as well the the financing model the financing models are quite well um, tested in in sub-Saharan Africa, so in the end like learning from solar home systems to your um, EV will be very useful. Um, I think the most important is that we really need to be sure about the technology. Like in the end, once something is sold as Paygo, the risk uh, lays with the client, with the customer, uh, and that that's like for example the reason why in our trials, we never want to sell the battery because that's quite risky. It goes out of service. So I don't, or as a foundation, we don't want to put that risk on the client. So meaning only selling the vehicles and the battery um, stays as a service, so for swap. So, but I think it's a big, uh, it's a big chance because it's like the one way that people uh, on the base of the permit, like low income earners have the chance to own the asset after let's say three or 400 days of, um, of pay. Okay, thank you, Mara. Uh, Srinivas, uh, I would uh, request your insights on a question, uh, which seems to be more uh, meaningful with the, the business and entrepreneurial mindset. The question here is, how can the EVs be marketed to the masses? Uh, moving beyond uh, its uh, main cause, uh, you know, giving benefits to environment, but uh, what are your thoughts of uh, seeing it gets more scaled, uh, both in private and government sectors? So share your views and thoughts around this. Thank you. Sure, uh, I mean, though I think um, Abhay and Mara uh, would be a better position to answer this question. Uh, but in terms of offering my two cents, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, because I haven't, uh, and the reason I say that is because I really haven't focused on the consumer segment with the Navy. But to draw a parallel from also what Mara, Mara was saying about the pay go model and learnings from solar, uh, which is a sector that I'm very familiar with, uh, I think. Um, uh, you know, in India, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, and it's a little controversial to say this, but it's, it's very difficult to make an argument uh, purely on environmental reasons, right? Uh, it's just got to make economic sense. That's the number one criteria, right? And uh, in terms of uh, consumer adoption of electric uh, two-wheelers um, uh, or even, you know, going up to four-wheelers, uh, I think, um, uh, and then also in terms of the perceived technology risk, Right, which is uh, which is all in the battery today, right? Uh, just being able to uh, grow battery leasing models, uh, like Mara was uh, suggesting, uh, I think absolutely essential uh, for consumer adoption, because you've just got to take the battery out of the equation, uh, let the battery experts manage that, and also finance it at the lowest cost possible for the customer, and it is not necessarily an OEM. Uh, who's in the position uh, to be able to provide that at the lowest cost. So from a consumer perspective, bring down the upfront capex by taking the battery out and equally eliminate the risk uh, in terms of the life they can get out of the asset because the battery, which is a big part, is already taken care of. So, uh, so I think uh, that, that would be a key contributor. But over to uh, my fellow panelists. Sure, thank you, Srini. 
Uh, Abe or Mara, any add on to this? Your thoughts? Sure, Richard. So I feel, um, uh, I think it's foremost important to understand what are the purchase drivers of various products which are placed in Indian market. So for example, purchase drivers for a buyer of electric rickshaw may be slightly different from a buyer of uh, electric four-wheeler. So is it only the cost or is it what they can earn out of owning an uh, electric vehicle along with obviously uh, other considerations like environment. So once we uh, you know, kind of do a mapping about what are the purchase driver, is it the environment piece, is it the uh, profit piece or uh, the livelihood piece which they can generate, then we can comment better on what uh, in, in what segment, what to uh, you know use as a selling pitch, as a marketing strategy. Uh, yeah, uh, certainly. I mean, well said. Uh, and when our topic here says uh, the overall ecosystem of EV, so certainly it includes uh, all sorts of vehicle and all sorts of segments of customer, be it on the consumer, sorry, being on the passenger car, to the e-rickshaw, to the two-wheeler, uh, which is what is we are India is you know the largest manufacturer and consumer of two wheelers worldwide. Mara, any uh, add on from you? Yeah, maybe one thought. Like I think when it comes to marketing, it's important to see as well. Like we call it social marketing. So which um, user groups do actually profit as well from electric vehicles? And sometimes it can make sense as well to to see if cooperatives or saving groups or companies uh, could be good clients. Um, for example, um, like if milk can be transported faster to um, the milk processing plant, so it's not going sour. So it might be that the milk company actually has interest in like providing their cooperatives with electric vehicles or bicycles in, in some way. So there are um, like, it, of course, it can be like, let's say, individual end clients, but as well, uh, user associations or companies could be um, interesting target group. So we're still in the beginning of that, but we see that, um, let's say, changing a bit the, the thinking and as well seeing, okay, if it's, for example, like a company, someone, they could have their own charging infrastructure. So it becomes interesting for different user groups than like petrol fueled uh, vehicles. Thank you, Mara. So we have one last question to our fellow panelist, uh, which is, uh, you know, again, talking about, again, I'm picking the question, which is, uh, more relevant with respect to the topic we have for the discussion today. Uh, Abey, to you, uh, what strategies can be used to improve the EV economics while increasing the range of EVs? So I think uh, it's just adding a step more than what we just uh, were talking about. And I'll just add up uh, to the next question too. Uh, what do you think uh, the role of power sectors or state power de departments, etc., cetera, uh, to really take part and reduce the help reducing the operational costs uh, of the charging and related infrastructure of ecosystem, uh, various means, right, including uh, but not limited to uh, tapping the renewable sources, which is the first choice, where you generate energy and consume directly as fuel, which is ultimate. You know, so what is your thought in overall uh, this space, looking at economy and which you know fuels the volume. Uh, the whole objective is how do we really get more volume? And certainly as we all recognize in India, economy is uh, the major driver for that. So over to you, Abhay. Sure, Richard. And in fact, I, I believe this uh, is partly answered by some of the policy, recent policies, which we saw various go state governments rolling out uh, on uh, offering battery as a service, wherein batteries can be sold separately uh, vehicle separately, which gives a comfort to some of the financiers, reduces upfront costs for the buyers. We have where they only have to, you know, uh, take uh, battery as a service, just like they purchase uh, conventional IC fuels. They purchase fuel for their electric vehicles. So that's a policy intervention which we uh, witnessed very recently. But I'm not sure about how this has been uh, the implementation of which has been going so far. And second, around the power department, you mentioned, I think. 
state some of the state government policy include uh, a reduction a discount in uh, the tariffs they charge uh, for electric vehicle manufacturers battery as a service providers charge station providers so i think there has been a significant policy intervention which has happened in favor of ev industry uh, and i i'm, I'm uh, very positive that in coming months and years we sure will see a uh, complementing uh, intervention by various stakeholders so i i to, to be honest i mean that's a work in progress as of now as we see in india uh, i think very well said you very well said because uh, we are at a uh, truly overall ev per se is in its infancy stage while we saw some great success stories of tesla and in china uh, otherwise uh, but still if you take the uh, a sectoral chain which is next going to be a 50 to 70 years or 100 years which is electric power train electric mobility we are just at a first not even 10% of that life right. so it's like you can see so i fully agree a lot of things to evolve and especially to emerging countries like ours or africa i think it's going to be taking a lot learning not the way it has been done in many of the developed world or cities because of different cost structure but how that same product and solution gets translated to our our cities or countries or communities especially all the emerging markets both uh, if, i mean multiple uh, locations they are spread over globally uh, the most important is how the whole adaptation piece work uh, you know both in terms of changing the product to make it fit to work in this abusive environment because the climatic conditions different Uh, the big difference obviously in terms of paying capacity whether it's a business for business or for the passengers so truly well said it's going to be an ongoing process uh, i think we are running uh, short of time uh, uh, i have one more question which is talking more towards technology side of aluminum aluminum fuel cell technology but i'm just we can uh, take that question you. richard if you want if you want Sorry? to take that question quickly if you want to we just can, answer oh, okay good thank you and i'm about to ask you So I have these two questions. So one I'll uh, pose uh, first to Mara uh, about her experience, having seen uh, uh, very closely African market, especially with respect to the motorcycle. I'll focus it to motorcycle because India is the country of motorcycle. When we say motorcycle, we are talking about the vehicle which are close to 100 cc in terms of performance, uh, which have a ability to touch. top speed of more than 60 uh, you know 60 to 80 kilometers uh, which is what first definition range certainly is depends on the fuel in the tank whether it's a battery size or you know we have 1 liter or 3 liter in the tank so i'll not go ra- range but the performance which the users here a lot of youths and uh, people who use two wheeler for business they need a certain power in the vehicle unlike china where the vehicle is used to just as a cycle or moped low speed low speed vehicle which is what globally in us europe also defined less than 25 km so bringing back focus equivalent to motorcycle or 100 cc type of ic engine vehicle what do you see uh, the differences uh, taking your experience of africa translating it to india and what is that possibly we can look at to really promote that segment globally Yes, I think thanks a lot. Exactly this kind of single use to like productive use is the biggest difference of motorbike in China, for example, like that people use it to go to work. In uh, in Africa, Eastern Africa, um, it's mostly used for uh, goods and people uh, transport. And of course, it's always a bit funny to see when somebody transport a sofa or like five goats with motorbike. But why is that? It's because there's not so many um, cars available. It's too expensive, and as well, lack of access to all season roads. So with a motorbike, you can um, even in rainy weather and rainy season, you can like still uh, maneuver ways that are not possible for cars anymore. Um, I think for electric vehicles, it's like a good entry product for many people because the cost is lower. So now for an electric motorbike produced in Nairobi, it's like. almost similar without taking battery out of the equation to um combustion engine motorbike so and i think what's like let's say when it comes to let's say partnering eastern africa and india motorbikes could be a good uh, segment because um indian uh, models are the most uh, most favored ones in eastern africa so 
Um, I think that could give a potential to say what is developed there um, could be as well um, used in Africa because the use patterns, at least for the countryside and for the heavy load, seem to be um, similar. Um, yes, so that's uh, my take on that. Thank you very much. I think we are just a minute or two away. I'll uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, every participants with uh, just few takeaways, which I could uh, scribble down from such a valuable uh, and engaging session. Uh, we heard uh, Abay talking about uh, something which is unique, uh, providing grant, uh, you know, guarantee for uh, as a collateral or something, which I, if I have got it right to uh, the low end of the e-rickshaw folks and bringing a uh, kind of a kind of a grouping of dealer plus market plus NBFC, amazing thing. Uh, about Mara uh, using the solar specific uh, energy and directly for electric vehicle mobility, and therefore it's a very good solution for especially islands, rural and remote area, which is what here in India there is a lot of similarity to. Uh, and then second life of battery you talked about uh, and recycle. So places like India certainly will leverage this and at Shakti, we are very closely engaging with a couple of these options, working and you know commissioning those studies here. So just as I add on to the benefit of participants, the third Srini has talked really amazing points. And what I really liked is uh, sharing of infra. Uh, to me, it sounded like telecom uh, tower, uh, which is what uh, my very early days. And to kill the cost, we got to be doing, uh, taking the learning what we have seen in our past few decades. So uh, that's very good for me while he did talk about financing, sourcing, charging, and also down the line managing the residual fallow. So very good thought uh, from Srini on this. And uh, last point before we conclude, uh, I believe uh, there's a strong need of awareness and confidence among all stakeholders and very precisely for the end users. And for that, we need to look for always a quality, reliability, and safety in the products and services which are being offered while we promote scaling up this, just to maintain the credibility and confidence among all the stakeholders, especially the end user again, I say. And that's the way we will achieve the economy of scale, uh, building step by step and going fast on it. Thank you very much. Over to you, Ankit. Thank you so much, uh, Ruchar. Uh, thank you so much, Mara, Shrinivas, and Abhay for the engaging discussion. We really value all your thoughts and we really uh, thank you all for bringing in the topic of, uh, you know, discussing the topic of electric vehicle economics, which is very important at this juncture and bringing in different perspectives from also the two-wheeler, three-wheeler, as well as buses and also the cross-country experiences of India and Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope that we continue this discussion forward and not just the end, but the beginning. And we'll keep engaging on this valuable topic and keep working with each other to ensure that we have, uh, you know, electrical ecosystem gets created in India. And we're not just talking about it, but we're creating these ecosystems and all of you are creating this ecosystem. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I hope we, everyone can join for the next session as well, which is on off-grid solar solutions in Africa, where we have also have engaging uh, discussion on the off-grid ecosystem and how it can be improved in the African context. Thank you so much everyone and happy to have you here and hope you will join us for the engaging discussions throughout the day as well.